Here's a quick guide to getting started with Paint and Stick 1.5. To get the best performance with Paint and Stick, always create a new solid that's the size of the comp and is a 2D layer that hasn't been translated or transformed in any way. Under Effect, go to AE Scripts and AE Plugins, Paint and Stick. The first thing you'll have to do is set your frame location, which is where your frames are actually saved, so make sure you put these frames somewhere permanent that's not going to be deleted. From here, you'll notice that you have no brushes. This is something new with Paint and Stick 1.5. We've actually created a separate brush palette, which you can show and hide with this button here. By default, there will be nothing in here. You need to set a brush folder. We've included starter brushes on the website. I'd recommend downloading that folder, placing it somewhere in your documents. I'm just going to put it on my desktop. Select it and press OK. The default brush and the soft brush will be generated automatically once you choose a folder. To change the brush size, hold Ctrl, click and drag, just like in After Effects. And to change the hardness, hold Ctrl, click and drag, then release Ctrl, and then click and drag more. So you can see how that's affecting the hardness of the brush. I'll just do a, a dot there, and then I'll bring the hardness back up, and clicking there. Right now I'm working on Windows, but it would actually be Command, click and drag on Mac. The shortcut for brush is B, the shortcut for erase is E, and the shortcut for mat is M. So to explain the difference between erase and mat, I'm just going to bring in another layer. And to make this explanation easier, I'm going to pre-compose it. I'm going to apply paint and stick to this chair layer, and I'm going to shut off paint on transparent because that's the only way you can see the difference between erase and mat. So I can paint on this chair here, on this layer, and if I press E for erase, then when I go to erase, Notice how it's just erasing the paint. And if I choose the matte brush, notice how it's going to erase the paint, but it's also going to erase through the layer. Also, if you want a real-time preview of this, you can press D to toggle the draw modes. By default, it's on fast draw. And you can erase this in real time. The main appeal to using fast draw is it's much faster and it's just going to give you a preview of what your stroke looks like, rather than actually interacting and rendering with After Effects. So I'm going to use Fast Draw for now, pressing the D key to toggle the draw mode. So brush draws, matte will paint through a layer, which of course won't be noticeable if you're not using paint on transparent set to off, and erase is going to erase the brush strokes, and it's also going to erase the matte strokes. So you can see I'm bringing back this layer here. Next, I want to explain keyframes and draw an animation. So I have my paint and stick layer here, and I'm going to press U. And you'll notice I have keyframes down here, paint keyframes and fill keyframes. Let's focus on the paint keyframes for now. Each keyframe represents a drawing. This drawing here, I can delete it if I just select this top keyframe, the paint keyframe, and press delete. And when I draw, you'll notice that a keyframe is created. I can move to the next keyframe, and uh, notice that that keyframe is not showing up and I can draw another keyframe. So if we go back and forth, we can see these are two separate drawings. Let me delete this. If you want to clear all of your keyframes, just like you can do in After Effects, you can just click this button, that will clear the keyframes. Or we have this button here, which clears all the keyframes just a little bit quicker and easier to get to. So let's say that we want to do a frame by frame animation. I would recommend using Onion Skin, which you can toggle on with the T key. So I'm just going to press T, and that turns on Onion Skin here. And to the next frame, now I'm seeing one behind. I'm actually going to change the number of onion skin frames here. If you go down here, you can uh, enable, disable, and also set your past and future frames. I'm going to set my past frames to 10. And my future frames to 10. And now I'm going to go very quickly frame by frame and do a short animation. Alright, now when I scrub backwards, you can see the onion skin is showing all my frames here. I can press T to toggle that off. And now I can play this back. Alright, so let's say that I want to slow this down. I'm just going to extend my timeline a little bit. I can grab my keyframes, and because they're just regular keyframes, I can hold Option, click and drag, and extend this. Another option to retiming these keyframes is to press this button right here, 
and use the uh, stretch and set that to 200. You could use this in a situation where you'd want to be animating exactly on twos, because when you option click and drag, the placement of the keyframes won't always be exact. So now when I play this back, you're going to notice some flickering, which is of course a problem. And the reason why is that these frames only show up as still frames on the frame that they're on. So if I go between frames, you're not going to see anything. So the easy fix for this is to create whole keyframes. If you select your keyframes and hold Control Alt and click on Windows, Command Alt and click on Mac, that's going to make each drawing hold from where it starts to where the next keyframe is. So it's a very easy way to retime your animation. At the end here, we want to have a clear keyframe because the animation is supposed to be ending. And to insert a clear keyframe, just press this button. Next, I want to show you the fill tool. So just for example's sake, I'm going to create a new solid. When you're using Paint and Stick, you have to select the effects to actually draw. And that can be a little bit of a pain. So we have a tool here called the Layer Selector. You can use this button to show and hide. And I'm just going to dock this down next to my timeline. And when you press refresh, it's going to take any layers that have Paint and Stick on them and put them here so you can select the effect with this button. So I'll put a new instance of Paint and Stick here on this bouncing ball layer. And when I refresh, I can move between the two of these, selecting the paint and stick effect. For this bouncing ball, I'm just going to use my default brush. I'll make it black. To make this a little bit easier to draw, I'm going to put on pat smoothing, which will smooth out my brush strokes a little bit. All right, this beautiful animation will have to do. If I want to fill in this region with color, I can press the F key, F for fill. Also, the G key will work as well, because that's the same key as in Photoshop, and I can choose a color. We'll just go with blue. And something else that's pretty handy, over here you can bring up a color palette, this uh, swatches palette. I'm just going to dock this above my brush palette. And when this is open, this is going to keep track of the colors that you're selecting. So over here, if I choose the color red, Notice how that appears up here. These are the recent color swatches. So when you choose new colors, the last 10 will remain up here. And then these are the custom colors. So if you decide you want to add a color, so for example, if I want to add orange, I have it selected here, and then I can press this plus button, and then that will create it down here. To delete colors, you can alt click on them. So there's a much better fill tutorial on the website that shows it in context of cell animation, and I would encourage you to check that out. But just for the basics, what's happening is uh, when I hover over a region, it's showing the preview of where it's going to fill. So if I click, it's going to fill this region, and I'm going to move to my next frame. And again, I'm getting a preview that's showing where the fill is going to be. All right, so those are filled. And I'm just going to bring up my keyframes here and stretch this out to make these uh, hold a little longer. So as you can see, it's pretty easy to get started with paint and stick. So next, let's take a really fast look at creating brushes. I'm going to make a new solid and I'll apply paint and stick and I'll just hide the other layer and I'll show you how to make a very simple brush. So I'm going to grab this blue color Put a dot here, and do another blue dot, and another, and I'll just do a white dot next. So now that we have this texture, we can uh, capture it and create a brush out of it. On Windows, hold Control, click and drag, and make your brush size as large as the texture, just a little bit larger and set your hardness up to 100. On Mac, that's command, click, and drag. Then make sure that this texture is soloed because it's going to have alpha values. On Windows, hold Control, Alt, and Shift, and then click when framing up your brush. On Mac, it's command, Alt, and Shift. Now you'll notice that your brush has been created. If you go over here, your brush has been placed in the brush folder. And now I can draw with this brush. So very quickly, let's take a look inside the brush folder. 
I have this brush selected and I'm going to click Reveal in Finder. So here's the new brush, it's, it's created under a random name, and here are all the other brushes. Our brushes are created in a PNG and JSON format, meaning that the brush texture itself is a PNG file, and all these brush attributes, size, size control, uh, the scattering, the color dynamics, all of that stuff is stored in a JSON file which has the same name as your brush. If you're really interested, you can open up the JSON and you can see all the names of the parameters and all their values. However, it would never really make sense to edit these inside of the text document. What happens is every time you make a change to one of these brushes, so for example, I'm going to change my angle control to direction. That parameter, as soon as I made that change, was saved into the JSON. You can experiment with the different controls in here, uh, many of which are very similar to Photoshop. I'm just going to set my size control to pressure. And the only tab that I'm going to focus on is the color dynamics tab, because actually the brush tip shape, shape dynamics, scattering, and transfer tabs are very similar to Photoshop, and most of you probably already know how to use these. Under color dynamics, we have three tint modes. There's sometimes a bug on Windows where when you click on tint mode, it's not going to show all of your options. Uh, this is a bug with After Effects scripting, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to resolve this soon. But once you have it selected, you can just use your mouse wheel to scroll. And here are your three modes, Tint All, Tint White, and Tint Black. So let's start with Tint All. I'm going to choose the color purple, and I'm going to set the tint amount to about 50%. And you'll see what's happening. It's basically just doing an even blend between the colors here and between the brush color. I'll turn that up to 100%, and you'll see that now the brush is tinted 100% to the brush color. To explain tint white and tint black, I'm going to make another image very quickly. Okay, so I've just made a gradient brush that's a mix between black and white. When I set this to tint black, and I set this up to 100%, You'll notice that the lighter colors are not affected, but all the darker colors are tinted. When I set it to tint white, you'll notice that the darker colors are unaffected, but the lighter colors are affected. And of course, tint all uh, affects both of them. So you can experiment with the different tint modes uh, to get different results. I'm just going to turn that off for now. And next, which is a little bit different from Photoshop, we have a uh, hue control. And this is going to act pretty much the same as the uh, hue saturation lightness control in After Effects, except it's going to apply to your brush. So I'll just put this to negative 180, and you'll see here, uh, that's how it affects my brush. Another thing I'd like to mention is what information is saved specifically with the brush and what is saved globally. Just like in Photoshop, your opacity up here, that's going to apply to all of your brushes. So I'm just painting there, that's at 50% opacity. Maybe this will be easier to see if I turn on a background. And here, this stroke is also at 50% opacity. And then when I turn that up, it's, it's applying to every brush. The same goes for flow, and the same goes for brush color. Everything in these tabs, however, is going to be unique per brush. You'll notice that uh, as I change through my different brushes, all these settings are going to snap to different values. And that's happening for all five of these tabs, but it's not happening for opacity, flow, and the color. The last thing I want to take a look at is uh, clone stamping. So let's say that I just have something drawn here, and I want to clone stamp it. To start the clone stamp, hold down Option and Shift, and then click. And then that's going to start the clone stamp. It's no longer showing your texture, so you know that the texture has no contribution to the clone stamp. And then you click and drag, and it works just like a clone stamp in any other software. The clone stamp works based off of a screen capture. Meaning that if you take a look at what I clone stamped, it clone stamped everything that was on the screen at the time that I did the clone stamp. So if you want to clone stamp just what's on this layer, you have to solo this layer, and then Option Shift click, and then you can clone stamp just that. The last function you may want to be aware of is screen capturing. Let's say for some reason you want this text as paint. The way you do it is you would solo the text layer, because it's going to screen capture, Hold down Shift with Paint and Stick selected, and then click. Then I can just uh, delete this text layer here, and you'll notice that this text is included as paint on top of this layer here. This becomes extremely useful when you're using the stick side of things. However, it can also be useful if you think of it like a merge in Photoshop, where you're merging all of your layers down to one single image. That's a brief overview of the paint side of Paint and Stick. Check out the website for more info.